What does, a, what does a good apprentice look like? Hear my opinions. What does it look like to be an electrical apprentice? What kind of compensation can you expect? How, how do you become a good apprentice? Gut check, should you even become an apprentice? What can you expect? So let's start with the compensation right at the beginning. Everybody wants to know. I'm gonna tell you, 15 years ago when I started, apprentices were starting at about 10 to 12 bucks an hour. I started at 10, I was a lame-o, zero experience of any kind. No trade school, no shop class, nothing. And then probably 10 years ago, 14 bucks an hour was the prevailing starting wage for larger companies, apprentices in larger companies. Now we're up to that 18 to $20 per hour range with some benefits. As an apprentice, you may not get any PTO, or you might. You may not get any retirement, or you could, and you probably don't get health benefits unless you're working for a larger company and that's a standard package. But 18 to 20 bucks an hour calculated over the course of the year with benefits, you're probably $50,000 a year as starting compensation. And your employer, if they're a good employer, should be paying for school. If they're not funneling their apprentices to trade school and if they're not promoting that and if they're not paying for that then that calls into question in my mind what level of quality they're delivering to their customers what level of consistency what level of training what standard do they hold themselves to is is good enough perfect or are they driving for excellence what are we looking at here we have what we call a zero percent tuition loan that means if you finish school if you finish a semester with a passing grade then we pay for school. And if you're with us for two years, then you don't owe us a dime of for that semester. But we prorate that, so if you exit our company, you now become financially responsible. And that's pretty common across employers. Now, I didn't go to trade school, but I wish I would've. Trade school looks like this. It's four years. You have to get 8,000 on-the-job training hours. It's one night a week for three to four hours. You have anywhere from two to 12 hours of homework every week. It's incredibly valuable because you are digesting the code, which is an impossible book to jump straight into. It's a technical document. It's too complicated and confusing. You're digesting the code in manageable portions and you're accelerating your career. You're increasing your compensation. The difference between an electrician who goes to school and an electrician who doesn't is probably a wage differential of about $20,000 per year. So what are the duties of an apprentice? The duties of an apprentice are all of the lowliest, most repetitive and mundane tasks on any and every job site. Let me tell you what, if you're working for a large contractor with 100 plus employees, you're probably doing very menial repetitive duties like trenching and nailing it on boxes over and over and over again. And it's probably the slightly more senior team members who are then running pipe and pulling wire or laying conduit in that ditch that you dug and now that you're backfilling. It starts at the very basic level and it's about seniority but if you're working for a smaller contractor, there's that division of labor is not so clear. There can be an incredible advantage to getting to be on a job site with only two or three other team members where you are now called upon to do a wider variety of tasks and to elevate your presence on that job site to more technical challenges. For instance, one of our team members went out and won the 2019 ABC National Championships after graduating from his fourth year of apprentice school. And what he said was, I noticed that all of my competitors worked for larger companies. They were sponsored to be there. They were fourth year apprentices just like me. But because they had always worked for a larger company, they had done the base, mundane, et cetera tasks. And they didn't have the suite of experiences that I had working for a smaller contractor. I've done all of these things in spades and more. I have a wider range of experience and he took home first place as national champion. So an electrician is responsible for the technical duties of the job site. The apprentice is responsible for the menial duties of the job site. So as my a master electrician who supervised my apprenticeship used to say, would you like to go in the crawl space or would you like me to stay up here? <laughs> 
Dude, if you're an apprentice, you're in the crawl space, you're in the attic, you're out in the cold, you are that guy. That is how you bring worth and value in the absence of knowledge and experience. You do the hard work. If you struggle with anxiety, this might not be right for you. You're gonna be on different job sites almost every day. You're gonna be interfacing with new people almost every day. I know electrical apprentices who are paralyzed in their career. I'm not exaggerating because of anxiety, because you're in such a wide range of circumstances with a significant amount of responsibility and liability connected to the quality of your work. So you're convinced that you wanna be an apprentice. How do you choose a contractor? Let me tell you what, they're almost all always hiring. So you need to be selective. You have the privilege of being selective because if you wanna be an apprentice and you have any shred of experience working with your hands, then you're a viable candidate. So let me tell you what, online, you want to check out their reviews. You want to look them up on the BBB and see how they're resolving disputes, how they're managing resolutions. You want to check them out on Google and Yelp. And if they're below four stars, that's probably an issue. That's probably a work management quality issue. And you probably want to be on a better track than that, a path that accelerates your career. Because when you have a high quality contractor in the eyes of the consumer, that's where those reviews are coming from, then you have greater earning potential. Because when the consumer says you're valuable, they're willing to pay for that. And that means earning potential. One of the things I recommend that you may not have thought of is a shadow day with a contractor. That's where you sign a release of liability, you show up on the job site for a day or even two days, and you work with the team. You're alongside the team, you're there to observe, and you're there to demonstrate what you have to offer. And that's incredibly valuable because you're gonna pick on the fine cultural elements of the team and whether it's a good fit or not. You know, I'm really selective when it comes to hiring team members and I'm really selective when it comes to who and where I'm willing to give my time and my energy, my most valuable resources. And I want it to be a place that's a good fit for my values, my goals and my objectives. And there's a contractor out there that's like that for you but you have to be selective. Do that shadow day, get on site. If it's not something that they offer, let it be something that you ask for. Incredibly valuable. If you are a top performer, if you think you have something to offer, if you have experience as a carpenter or something that's related and relevant, when you show up on the job site and the average starting wage for that contractor for an apprentice is 16, 18 bucks an hour, and you show up and you demonstrate something different, you could land a starting wage, like some of our apprentices had, of over 20 bucks an hour. You could define a new normal. So that's your opportunity to define a new normal in their eyes. So what are the warning signs to look for on a shadow day? Warning signs look like this. Guys, all contractors struggle with having every team member arrive perfectly on time, every team member with a crisp understanding of exactly what's taking place, um, company and customer expectations perfectly aligned, perfect execution of the job, final customer satisfaction, no shortages in materials. It's all hard, but you're gonna shadow multiple contractors and you're gonna be looking for a consistency that these things are lined up, not perfect, but they're, they're lined up and there's a consistent effort. There is um, a consistent outcome that's taking place. If not perfect, at least consistent. You're gonna look for personal appearance of those team members. You're gonna look for um, their vocabulary of choice and how they choose to convey themselves. You're gonna look for um, the age and quality of tools and equipment and where they're investing. You're gonna ask those team members about their certification, their experience, how the company is investing in them. You're gonna, uh, guys, honestly, you're gonna, you're gonna look for the smell of alcohol on their breaths. I don't care if it's 8 a.m., watch out for it. You're gonna look for how many smoke breaks they're taking and how focused they are on the job performance and how quickly they deviate to um, tangential conversations or uh, just, there's so many things to distract, social media, use of the cell phone. You want to work for a contractor who is providing incredible value to that customer because that's a contractor that is going to give you room for growth. They're going to give you that future and that career path where there is compensation, there is increase, there is investment and it all pays off and everybody wins. 
If you're not selective in choosing a contractor, you're gonna end up job hopping. I tell you what, I have one experienced candidate with like 8,000 hours of experience and lots of certifications in our domain who came to us and he wanted a job, but he's got the history of being a job hopper. He's got the evidence that there's no loyalty in his life. He's got the evidence on his resume that he's gonna move on as soon as he gets a better offer. And that's no good because we're gonna invest in him and that investment's gonna go right out the door. So that's a disqualified candidate. So if you're not working at one place after making a careful decision for at least 12 months, you're gonna be seen as a job hopper too. So a quick touch on union versus non-union. This is my personal perspective. You can rail at me in the comments if you so choose. Non-union, you're gonna have more latitude and flexibility you're gonna have a greater ability to pivot through your career into things that are of greater interest to you. You're gonna have that, that magical word, latitude, the power of choice. Union contractors are gonna to tend to be a little bit more regimented and constrained, internally constrained, but that's also because there are a substantial amount of external constraints upon them. So if you want the power of choice, I think non-union is a good way to go. If you want security and benefits, then union might be right for you. So how do you be a good apprentice? When it all comes down to it, what, is a, what does a good apprentice look like? Here are my opinions. A good apprentice is someone who shows clear evidence of investment in a clear direction before they even come to you looking for a job. That's my evidence. If this guy's already enrolled in trade school, paying his own money, spending his own time because he know he, he wants to become a master electrician, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you're so dedicated to this pathway that you dropped a thousand bucks on your first semester plus books, hired. If you're a cultural fit, you've almost certainly got a job here because that's what I'm looking for. A good apprentice is someone who shows up 15 minutes early to the first interview, someone who dresses professionally. It doesn't have to be suit and tie, but it needs to be sharp. Someone whose mind is in the game. If they can't yeah, answer any questions related to the trade or the industry, then they've not done any research. They don't know what they're in for. They don't know about the spiders in the crawl spaces. They're too naive. You've got to vet and form them and vet them. Someone who's already done that themselves and comes in with an informed opinion and a clear direction provides so much value. They're months, months down the road from that naive individual who just kind of like me <laughs> thinks that they might want to try being an electrician. You can't dump investment in that person. They don't know where they're going. That doesn't make sense for a company. So clear prior investment, clear direction, informed about the industry, and some kind of hands-on experience. Like landscapers, you know they'll work in the cold, you know they're not afraid of the heat, you know they know how to work hard, harder than an electrician has to work. That person, by the fact that they've held down a landscaping job for two, four, six, eight years, even done it you know, through the summer in college or high school, that's a value. They know what they're in for. I tell you what would floor me, is not only if this team member was signed up for trade school, but if they had watched all of our Electric Pro Academy t videos and they could bring it to the employer and say, hey, look, I've digested 200 videos. I, I've got real skills to make real money. That is a leg up. That is a financial advantage to the employer and to the employee. If you think you'd make an ideal apprentice or if you're already in the trades, check the link in the description, jeffersonelectricllc.com backslash join the team and subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money.